in this video we're going to look at the beautiful soup tool beautiful soup is a tool that is imported from the bs4 library um, we'll need numpy and we're going to import that as mp we're going to use the url open um, tool which is in the request drawer of the toolbox url library we're also going to import stats models as SM to do a simple linear regression. And then we need to graph our uh, resulting plot. Um, so we need to import matplotlib.pyplot as just PLT. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to bring the data set in. And we're going to use beautiful soup, like we mentioned before, to web scrape. The data we're going to use for this really cool example before you proceed you want to make sure that this link works so i'm going to go up here and i've already tried it up here so i'm going to paste it right there and then hit enter and it does work and we want to get the table here we could you know copy this right we could copy this and then you know if it's a really long table this might take forever we can copy this whole table and we can transfer it to Excel pretty quick, right? So get the table, we could copy it and then paste it into Excel, right? But if you have to do this every morning, um, you could just hit run on this um, program and it'll get it for you in, in a fraction of a second. So that's the data set, right? Um, so that's the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure this works. So what this does is, um, beautiful soup is going to use this tool URL open. It, URL open is going to open up this in a Python, and then beautiful soup is going to um, grab the HTML code that creates this web page, right? So let's look at what HTML is. We're gonna go ahead and print it. Now I could have named this object right here. I could have named this object. I could have named it Joe. I could have named it Hal. I could have named it anything, but I named it HTML. Right, so this is an object, and that object is what? Well, let's run this and see what happens. Okay, so the object that we defined HTML is the HTML code of that web page, right? And we can verify that by going here to this website, right clicking, and uh, click on View Page Source. So let me move this down here. So you can see the code. So this is the HTML for this website. And we can verify by doing this. We can find this title. And this right here is, this right here is the title that goes on the tab. Right here, see? This is the tab title right there. This right here is the title of the website that you see. Right there, right? We can find this in the HTML code as well. So there's that in the code, right? So where is the table? Where is the table at? Let's go back to Jupyter here, Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so in the very next line, in the very next line, we have this thing called bowls. What is bowls doing? Well, remember this and this, both those refer to this object, the HTML code, right? And you, we could have called it anything. Bowls is looking through this HTML code down here, it's looking for something in that code that identifies the start of a table. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy wiki table. 
and I'm going to hit control F and then hit enter. Okay, so you see right here, this is the start of that table, right? So this is the start of the table and down here is the end of the table. So the table is ended when the HTML code has a less than symbol slash table greater than symbol. This right here tells, um, this indicates the that this is the end of the table, right? It has a table body, and then this is the end of the last row, and this is the end of the last column, the delimiter, right? The beginning of the table is right here. So the beginning of an HTML object is just the greater than symbol. And then we have table, we have the class of table, right? And then we have the start of the table body, the start of the first row, um, which is the header names, right? TH is the delimiter for the column names. So we have name of player, team, position, height, um, age, and then the end of that very first header row, right? So this is what we're looking for. And so what this code does right here, what this code does is it will strip away all the HTML code with the exception of the HTML code that identifies the beginning and the end of the table. Okay, so I need to, if I wanna print off what that looks like, I need to change HTML here to bowls and then run and print this. So it's gonna print just the HTML code where the table starts. This is where the table starts. You can see that first row of header names, right? Variable names. And then all the way to the bottom to the end of this HTML code. All the way to the bottom, which is, it's a pretty long table. And this is the last row, Josh Kinney, right? And that right there is the end of the table, right here. That's the end of the table, okay? So that's what bowls is. And the reason why I call it bowls is because the tasty stuff is the data, the soup, and the soup is inside the bowls. And the bowls is the table structure, the collection of cells. So each cell is a bowl and each bowl has tasty data inside of it called the soup, right? Okay, the next part of our beautiful soup algorithm, pulling, web scraping the data. All right, so we want to get the row. So we're gonna start a for loop that looks for what? That finds all what? TRs. All right, TR can denote the beginning and the end of a row. So let's just go back to our source code, All right? So if we, here is a TR. So this for loop is looking for the TRs, right? Here's the beginning of a row and here's the end of the row, right? So we're looking for the TR here and the end TR here, right? And then we have another row starting here, right? This starts a new row that ends that row. This starts a new row and that ends that row, right? So that part of the for loop is looking for that, right? It's looking for those TRs. So let's just go ahead and print um, each row. So we're gonna print row, okay? Now the thing about this is every time it goes to the loop, it's gonna print a new row. Right, so you can think of the rows being printed as short-term memory. Every time it goes through the loop, it will replace the previous row with a new row, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit run right here. So this, the first time through it prints this row. Notice it does not print um, 
the header row. It doesn't pr print the header row. So let's go back and look why. I would think it would have printed the header row, but it doesn't. It only prints the um, non-header row. Okay. So the first time through, it's printing that first row. Right? Let's try this. Let me change this to zero and see what happens. Oh, there we go. Okay. This is really cool. This is something I did not know before. Okay, this is what this is the row we start at, right? This is the row we start at. So that we we put in uh, zero here, and the very first row is going to be uh, the header row, right? The header row. Okay, but notice we have an error here. There's no TD here. These are THs. These are header, right? These are headers, not uh, delimiters for the data, right? You can think of the D as the delimiter for the data. So we have an error here. And so we're not getting the very first row of data. We're getting the very first row of header names. So to avoid this error, we need to change this back to one. Remember in Python, the very first row is denoted zero. The second row is denoted one. So we want to put one there and this will skip, this will skip that first row that is the header names, right? That skips the first row that is the header names because there's no TDs there and we get this error message, right? So let's go back and run this. All right, so here's our first row, right? This is row one. Row zero is the header row, right? Here's row two, row three, row four, etc. Now, these data are not being locked into long-term memory, um, if you will. Every time through, Python is forgetting this and then renaming row that. The next time through, it forgets this and names the row that, right? And here's proof of it. If I take print row out of the loop, if I take it out of the loop here, and I put it down here outside the loop, right? And I run this, what this will do is it will print whatever row is when the for loops stop and it'll end up being the last row. This is the last row here, right? So nothing, none of the previous rows have been stored in long-term memory. Only the last row has, and I can show you that here. Let's go to the very last row. The last row of this table is Josh Kinney. He plays St. Louis relief pitcher, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're not, we're not locking any way, anything away in long-term memory yet, right? All right, so let's go back up here and, and further explore this, this algorithm, right? Now, what is soup? Soup is looking for the TDs. We've already kind of looked at that, right? Soup is looking for the TD, TD. So let's go ahead and print soup within the loop, right? Let's go ahead and print soup within the loop. Hey, that rhymes. Okay, so this first time through the loop, first time through, soup is that, right? And you can see the HTML code here. You have the start of the first column, the end of the second column, or sorry, the end of the first column. You have the start of the second column, the end of the first column, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So we have HTML code that we want to get rid of, right? The soup has pieces of the bowl in the soup and pieces of the bowl in the soup is not tasty, is it? So we need to get rid of the HTML code, right? So we need to get rid of the HTML code. And that's the first time through, right? Again, we're not storing that information away in long-term memory. We're losing it every time we go through the loop. 
this is what soup is the second time through this is what soup is the third time through etc 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 right and i can show that again by doing this i'm going to print soup outside of the loop to show you that we're not storing information for the long term all we know is what the last row is once this for loop for loop is done so let me go ahead and run that Here's the last row with parts of the bowl broken off into the soup, right? We have a comma here that separates. Um, so this delineates the columns. So we don't want this stuff here, do we? We don't want this HTML code. So we got to figure out how to get rid of that HTML code. Well, the next line right here, this line here gets rid of the HTML code. It converts the thing in column zero of the row to text. So this strips away the HTML code from that very first soup, the soup in the first bowl. This strips, strips away the HTML code in the second bowl of soup in that particular row, right? This strips away the HTML code in that third bowl of soup, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so now let's print, let's get rid of print soup. So let me go back down here before we move on. This right here is soup zero of the last row. This is soup one of the last row. This is soup two of the last row. This is soup three of the last row. This is soup four of the last row. And this is soup five of the last row. We wanna strain out the broken pieces of the bowl, right? The, these HTML frag code fragments, right? We wanna strip that out. So that's again what this does here. So let's print, let's print, print row K. We'll print each row K. And you're gonna see there is no HTML code here, right? Left in it. So each time through, we're getting rid of the HTML code, right? See that? There's no more HTML code. So the first time through, this is what row K is. The second time through, that's what row K is the third time and the fourth time. Again, we're not locking away anything in long-term memory, right? These are all, this is a local variable, a local variable. And I'll show you again why that's the case. Okay, now we're gonna print, we're gonna print what row K is when the four loops end. And again, it's the last row, right? With no HTML code, right? So let me show you what this looks like in Notepad. So a notepad right here, this is, this whole thing is the bowls, right? So let's just do a little recap in notepad. Bowls finds the table. It strips out all the code, but the HTML code for the, um, the table, right? So all the other, all the other HTML code is stripped out except for the start of the table, and the end of the table, right? So that next line of code in Python, rows in bowl find all TRs. What that does is it gets rid of, if you will, each time through, it's getting rid of this stuff right here. It's getting rid of that stuff, right? It's getting rid of that stuff. Okay. So it finds the TRs, right? It finds the TRs. Um, again, using a zero or one here instead of a zero, if we put a zero here, um, the first row would have, been, would have been this. And we would have had an error, right? We had an error there because there's no TD there, right? We're, we're, so we're looking for TD in the next for loop, right? We're looking for the TD in the next for loop. So we have to, we have to get, we, we want to get rows one through whatever, right? We don't want rows zero through whatever. We want rows one through whatever. So um, specifying that right there means we skip over that first row. So it essentially just deletes that, right? Okay. Now we're looking for TDs, right? We're looking for TDs. So when we 
go to these two steps, right? When we go to these two steps, essentially what Python has done, it has eliminated, it has eliminated um, this code here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy it. I'm gonna hit Control H. I'm gonna hit Control V. And I'm gonna replace that with nothing, right? So it's essentially stripping, these two next lines of code are stripping the HTML code out, right? So I'm gonna click uh, replace, 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 and then I'm gonna hit replace all, right? And then the next thing it does is it, it gets rid of the end of the last column and the end of the row HTML code, right? So it's looking for that and it's getting rid of it, right? And then I'll click re replace all, right? Okay, cool. All right. And then this right here, the dot text gets rid of the HTML code and replaces the HTML code between the soups with a comma, right? Whoops. So now we're, now we're gonna replace, we're gonna replace this right here, all of these, we're gonna replace that with a comma, right? So this is kind of what uh, the, pro, the beautiful soup is doing. Okay, we're gonna replace, replace. So we're replacing all those with commas, right? I'm gonna hit replace all. And now we have a comma separated value file, right? I can actually open this in Excel. I can open this in Excel after I save it. I can save this as um, baseball.csv. Well, I'll just go ahead and save it as baseball. Yeah. I can save it as baseball.csv and then I can open it. I can open it up, open that file, baseball.csv, this one here. I can open that in Excel and it'll put it in columns. It'll put this data in columns. See that? It puts it in columns. So that is what that code is doing. Let's go back here and review a little bit. Row K, every time through, row K is being forgotten and replaced, right? The first time through the loop, row K is that. The second time through row K is that. And notice that all of the HTML code has been stripped away. Third time through, it is that. The final time through the loop, row K is this, right? Row K is that. So we're not locking away any of this data in the long-term memory, right? We need to figure out how to lock this information away in long-term memory. Right now, every row above Josh Kinney has been forgotten, right? Every row above it has been forgotten. Okay, so this is where baseball comes in. I haven't talked about it yet, but I define baseball up here to be something, right? An empty row. Okay. It's an empty row with one empty cell, two empty cells, three empty cells, four empty cells, five empty or five empty cells, six empty cells. This column is column zero, column one, column two, column three, column four. And the final column is named column five, right? Notice that I have column zero here, column one here, column two here, column three here, column four here, column five here, right? Yep, column five here. So baseball needs to have the same number of columns, right? And then this final row in the for loop code has something called MP B stack. B stack stands for vertical stacking. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this here, right? We're going to take this here and I'll go ahead and print. Um, I should have left it on there. Print row K. And what we're going to do is this, we're going to, we're going to, the first time through, 
we're going to put this right here. We're going to put this on top of row K the first time through. So this is kind of what it's going to look like. So the first the first the first time through, we'll take this empty row and we'll stack on it um, whatever that first row is, right? So we're going to stack these two together using this command. So the best way to show it is just by doing this. I'm going to, within the for loop, I'm going to print baseball. I'm going to print baseball. And this is how, we, this is how we're going to uh, put all this information into long-term memory, right? Baseball is our long-term long memory, right? So now I'm going to print baseball each time we go through the for loop. And you're going to see something really cool. The first time through, we add below our empty row, that very first row of baseball, right? Adam Donachi. The second time through, right? This is now baseball, right? That's baseball. We add on that second row, right? The third time through, baseball is now bigger, right? Baseball is now bigger. We add on the Ramon Hernandez row, right? Yada, yada, yada. You can see that baseball gets taller and taller and taller every time through the loop, right? We're stacking it and it's getting taller every time through the loop. Now baseball is really tall. Eventually baseball gets so tall that Python will not print the whole thing out anymore, right? Here, baseball is really tall. We'll keep going. Baseball is getting really tall. So Python will get to the point where it just decides to not print the whole thing. So baseball is getting taller and taller every time. Every time through the loop, it's getting adding a row, right? It's adding row K. Row K changes every time um, we go through the loop. Now here we go, right? So now right here with the, it's not printing the whole thing. So this is the last time I printed the whole thing. So now this is baseball, right? This is baseball up here. Fernando Cabrera Brea is the final row of baseball up here. This time through the loop, we add row K to it, right? So Tom Mas Mans Masney, Masney, Tom Masney, Cleveland. Um, he's now the final row of baseball, right? And then we add row K. So every time we're every time we go through the loop, we're making this table longer, right? <laughs> and you can see down here, the second time, second to last time we're through the loop, Randy Keisler is the last row. But the last time through the loop, Josh Kinney is the last row, right? So now I hopefully we appreciate how cool beautiful soup is. I'm going to move the print statement out of the loop and show you that uh, Python's really fast at going to a website, grabbing data from a table, and put it into a Python object called baseball. Boom, there it is, right? Baseball's done, right? That is baseball. Now, notice we have this empty row here. We got to get rid of that empty row. We need to get rid of that row, right? We don't want that in our data set, right? It'll mess things up. So we got to get rid of that empty row. So this that's what this is for here. Here's baseball. This is baseball before it's altered. This right here indicates um, either first row or first column. Remember, Python objects, the first row is indicated by a zero. The first column is indicated by a zero, right? And then access zero means row. Access one means column. So if this is zero, zero, what that means is we're going to delete the first row, right? This is row. We're going to delete that first row, right? We're going to delete it. Okay, so let's move. Let's copy print baseball here and print baseball here. So we're going to print it before the deletion and we're going to print it after the deletion to compare the two. So this is before 
the deletion, right? We have that empty row in front of Anip Donici. The last three rows are Chris, Randy, and Josh Kinney, right? So the last three haven't changed, but the first three have changed, right? We've deleted that first row. So let's go back up here and see what happens when we change the axis. If we change this to one, we're changing the dimension, right? Instead of using the zero dimension, which is the rows, now we're looking at the other dimension, which is the columns. So you're gonna see something interesting here. Okay, so notice we haven't deleted that first row, but what have we de deleted? We've deleted that first column, right? We deleted the first column. This first row is skinnier, right? It's got one less column than up here. Down here, our first column starts with the team catcher and then out to the age, right? Up here, we have the player, the team catcher out to the age, right? So that shows you what axis does, right? A one says we're gonna delete a column. This says first column. If I change that to a one, check out what happens here. Again, zero is the first column. This means column here, right? So zero is the first column, one is the second column. Check this out. Okay, now we have the first column, column zero, right? But we've lost the team column, haven't we? See that? We've lost the team column. So we change this back to zero and change this back to zero we can see that we're deleting the first row, right? We're deleting that first row. The first row in a Python object is named zero. The second row is named one. <laughs> if I change this to one, we're gonna delete the Adam Donici row, right? Yeah, we kept row zero, right? We kept row zero, but we deleted the row indicated by the number one. Right, which is the second row, right? So Adam donachi has gone down here. This is kind of cool too. If we change this to minus one, minus one refers to the last. So we're gonna delete the last row in this um, use of MP delete. So the last row was originally Josh Kinney. Now the last row is Randy Kaiser because we deleted the last row, right? So let's go back up here and change this to zero and hit run. Okay. And the reason why we want to do that is this is what baseball should be. If we keep baseball with this row in it, what happens? Will it produce this graph? If we hashtag this out and don't delete that very first row of empty stuff, we get an error in the code. See that? We get an error in the code because we haven't deleted that column of empty stuff, right? Python doesn't know, know what to do when a column of numbers is empty, right? Excel, Excel does the same thing, right? If you run a regression on Excel with an empty cell, you get an error message, right? Okay, so we need to do that. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of these two print statements. Now I'm gonna go down here, right? Baseball column zero. What is baseball column zero? And we got to print baseball again. Let's print baseball again. Okay, column zero is the names. Column one is a team. Column two is catcher. Column three is height. Column four is um, weight, and the last column is age. So this right here is, uh, we're gonna take name, we're gonna create a name object called name. We're gonna create this object name, and it's the first column of baseball. Team name is the second column of baseball. Position is the third column of baseball. Height, is the fourth column of baseball, and we're converting it to integer, right? Because up here we, we uh, put them in baseball as text, right, as text. Weight is the fifth column of baseball, and we're converting it to an integer. And then age 
is the final column of baseball uh, named five, which is actually the sixth column. And we're converting that to a float, right? So let's just print, uh, we'll, we'll print uh, position and age and height. We'll just print those three. Okay, so this is position. This is weight or height, and this is age. Notice up here in baseball, 74 is in quotation marks. 180 is in quotation marks. And then 22.99 is in quotation marks with a slash nine, right? That means this is a float, right? But it's been converted to a string. We can't add up uh, strings of characters, right? We have to convert these. We have to convert these to floats, right? We have to convert these to floats, which now they are, right? There's no quotation marks around that. We have to convert this to the string of characters to a number 74, which that line of care that line of code does, right? All right, so we can delete that, and we can delete this. Now down here, I'm making a copy of position. I'm making a copy of position. So let me let me print color and position. So this is color. And this is position. Why am I doing that? Well, I'm going to change in color. I'm going to change catcher to a color, right? So I can color coordinate these things. So here for I in range of the length of color, length of color is how many rows it has. So for I from uh, zero to the length, the last row in color, I'm going to change color um, in a row, in every row that is currently defined to be relief pitcher to the color red. I'm going to change every row in color from starting pitcher to red. I'm going to change every row in color that is designated hitter to blue. And I'm going to change all the other positions to green. So first baseman, outfielder, catcher, second baseman, third baseman, shortstop. These are all infield. These are all fielders. So I'm changing them to green. So I got pitchers in red and I got designated hitter in blue. And then I got all of the players in green, right? So let me change. Let me print color up here and then color after all the changes are made. Okay, so before the change, that's what you had, right? After the change, those positions have been changed to color, which is why these dots down here are different colors. Okay. I'm gonna do something real quick. I'm going to output, I'm going to change uh, color I'm going to call it a PD data, I'm going to call it color DF for data frame. I'm going to change color to a pandas data frame. And then I'm going to save it. Okay, this is gonna save it to a CSV file. So let's run that. Okay, now I need to open up that CSV file. So the these files are in the C drive um, in the user subfolder, in my subfolder. 
and we're looking for color df there's color df so this is that um object we just defined hmm. that's weird this is that before the changes are made so let's go back here oh that makes that makes total sense right because i put this before the changes were made now let's go down here this is after the changes are made right so let me close this out don't save and then rerun it so let's go ahead and rerun it now we're going to we're going to do that same thing. Now the changes have been made to color, right? Before, color was just a copy of position. So now let's run this. And then I'll open up that file again. Date modified. There's color. Now the color is going to be changed, right? See that? All the colors have been changed. And you want to do this because if you made a spelling error in the code, one of the positions might not have been changed. And I'll demonstrate that here in a second, right? So all the ch colors have been changed, right? All the colors have been changed. Okay, suppose you made a spelling mistake up here. Maybe you you didn't put in an underscore there. You misspelled it. Let's run it and see what happens. We're going to get an error, right? Why do we get an error? Okay, so let's open up that color um, CSV file. See that? Python doesn't know what to do when you get to uh, an observation that is second underscore baseman. Python doesn't know what that is. It's looking for something like green, red, blue, purple, yellow, whatever, right? Black. So when it comes to second baseman, it doesn't have a color assigned to that phrase, right? So that's why you want to kind of check to make sure that you um, did this right. And the one way you can do it, is you can go back to the original source file and you can look for a second baseman here, right? Second Okay, there it is. So what you can do is you can just copy the value as it is in the table. You can copy it and you can go back to your error, right? We found our error and then we can paste it right here. And then we run this. We run this and then we won't have an error, right? Okay. So that's that's pretty cool, I guess. Yep. Okay, the next thing we want to do is we want to we want to graph weight on the y-axis with height on the x-axis so we're using this sm function this um, stats model we have stats model here and we import it as sm so we're going to graph this first part here let me just uh, do this let me just do this here Okay, so what is this right here? I'm going to go ahead and comment this out right here. So we have a pretty good idea what this is down here. Okay, so this is the title of our plot, our scatter plot. This is the name of our X label on that scatter plot. And this is the name of the Y label. This is just the names, right? And then F1 is our model. F1 is our model. We're going to use the stats model uh, library. And one of the tools in the library is OLS, right? So we're going to use the OLS, ordinary, ordinary least squares tool in the stats model toolbox, right? Our Y is weight. And then um, we need to add a constant here. Right? If we don't do this, we won't get a constant. We'll just get a line that goes through the origin. And then the, our X variable is height. So this right here is a model with a constant and an X variable height. And then this fits it, right? This fits it. So if I print 
F1, what am I going to get? I'm going to get the slope and the intercept. Okay, so that didn't work. Let me go back up here and do um, F1 dot parameters. Params. Let's do that. F dot params. This should give us our slope and intercept. Yep, there is our intercept, and that is our slope. That's our slope. Okay. So if I do this, zero, that right there is our, this right here is our intercept, and this right here is the slope, right? That's the slope. So this is the intercept, and that's the slope. We can also round them, right? We can round them to four decimal places. So they're not so onerous in terms of lots of decimal places. <laughs> oh, I got to close off this parenthesis here, right? Okay, so we've rounded the intercept and the slope, right? So we can actually now create our equation of our line. I can start this off with y equal to, right? Close parenthesis. I'll do a comma, right? And that comma will concatenate this intercept to the string, right? And then I can do um, a plus and a comma. And then I can do comma and then X. And this should give us our equation of our line. Right there, see that? That's cool, isn't it? See that? That's the equation of our line. So we have our intercept and then we have our slope, and then we have the x value. So we can in, we can uh, create a output for our line. Now we don't need print color anymore. So let's run that without that. It'll just show the line, right? So there's our intercept, there's our slope, and that's our equation for our line. <laughs> okay, so. What does xplot do? Let's print xplot. And see what happens. <coughs> okay, so what xplot does is it's got this mp.min height an MP dot max height. So the minimum height is 67 inches tall. The maximum height, the maximum height is 83 inches. So what it does is it creates, maybe the best way to do this is to um, do this here. I'll, I'll copy this into Excel. So it takes that minimum value there, right? It takes that minimum value and adds to it this little increment, right? Until we get to the maximum value of 83, right? Until we get the maximum value of 83. Right there, there's the maximum value of 83, see that? So it's generating a bunch of heights. And that's what x that's what x plot does, right? It takes a bunch of um, it takes the max the minimum and the maximum and it creates a bunch of values in between, right? 
It looks like 50 values in between. Yeah, 50 values in between. That's what that does, right? Why does it do that? Well, we'll see that right here. Okay, so it does a pi plot right here. Pi plot. X plot, X plot is going to be fed into our linear model, right? This is our intercept, right? That's our intercept. That's our slope. And these are the, the vector of all those Xs. So let me grab our model here. I'll just grab our model here. I'll take it over to Excel. And I'll type times and I'll hit 67. So these are the these are the weights. You can call them the you can call these the weight weights hat, right? These are the predicted weights. We call it hat because um, the predicted values of a regression are typically y hat. So that's what we call weight hats, right? So those are our predicted values for each one of these x's right and then we can graph these together we can graph these together in excel insert scatter plot and there is our line right that's our line this is the same line if i were to right click on this add trend line and add equation it would give us the same equation Ah, oh, that's cool. See that? It gives us the same equation. Okay. So that, that's what this is doing. So if I do a plot show, it's going to be a straight line in, um, in Python. That's our line, right? That's our line. From a minimum of 68 to maximum of 83, right? See that? That's the regression line. It's this line right here right that line there so then the next question is what does this do this is the scatter plot we're going to put a scatter plot on top of this um, regression line plot right so this is going to put the dots in there it's going to do it in a way though let's just do this real quick i'm going to put a hashtag here so all it's going to do is it's going to do the, the observed heights versus the observed weights from our data set and we're going to run that Okay, so this is our scatter plot, right? With our regression line. You see that? And you can, this is pretty obvious what this line is, what this line represents. At this height, we expect these players to be that weight, right? So this line gives us, it's a regression line. We're regressing to the, the mean, right? For a given value of X, we're going back to the mean, right? So down here, when we're talking about players of height 70 inches, we expect those players to be this height, right? So this is the average, if you will, of these players, right? This is the average of these players, right? Okay, so it's our predicted value. It's what we expect. Um, so we expect the players to be for each uh, weight, right? For each weight. Now let's add in size we're gonna add in the size whoops this is size size equal to so this is going to change the size of the dot and we have the age to the fifth power divided by 250,000 to kind of like this right here does what it kind of over exaggerates what's going on right it's going to over exaggerate if we just did age there wouldn't be much to this graph. Oop, I think that's the problem. There we go. So it didn't really change it much. We don't really, we can't really tell. So let's let's uh, take it to the let's square let's square age. Let's square the age. Let's see what happens. 
We want to over exaggerate. That's you know a little too much maybe. So if we go to the fifth power and then we divide, if we go to the fifth power, it's going to be um, the blue is going to cover the whole graph. So we're trying to figure out how to um, over exaggerate the older players. So we'll do h to the fifth power divided by 250,000, see what happens. Okay, so we have some, that's pretty good. We got some young players and the, over, the older players age is, ages are over exaggerated, right? So that's what that part of the code does. Now let's do the color part. The color part, this C equal is the color. And remember we, we created this uh, variable called color, right? By position. We run that. Whoop, I gotta put a hashtag in there. These colors are solid, so we really can't see what's going on. So that's why we have alpha here. Alpha allows us to uh, make the dots transparent. So if we go down to two, we can see where there, where there are pileups in the dots. Okay, so there's pileups right in here, right? Most people are right in here. See that? Very few people out here where it's really light. And what do you notice here? The blue dots, which are the designated hitters, are all above what we expect. What we expect for a person's height is this black line. So that means uh, designated hitters are uh, heavier. They tend to be heavier than their counterparts, right? And that makes sense because designated hitters, they um, come onto the field when they are, their turn to bat is up, right? So they might only be on the field three times during a game if there's an awesome pitcher. If they're facing an awesome pitcher and the pitcher is mowing down the batters, right? The designated hitter might hit fourth, generally. So they might not show in the first inning. They'll show up in the second inning. Then they won't show up until maybe the seventh inning. So they might only be on the field two or three times a game if you're faced with a really good pitcher, right? So they're not really doing much. They're sitting on the bench a lot in the dugout, right? So, and then when they come in to hit, you want the designated hitter to be a big guy who's strong, who can hit the ball over the fence for a home run. So if they get a hit and get a home run, they're either probably gonna get a hit or a home run, or I mean, they're probably gonna get out or a, a home run. And so, they either go back to the bench if they get an out or they jog around the base path slow. And so they're not really doing much other than swinging the bat and jogging around the base path or walking back to the dugout, right? So that's kind of interesting. The rest of these are pretty straightforward. That puts in the title, right? That puts in the title to the graph, right? And then this puts in the X label to the graph Right, the X label height. And then this PLT dot Y label puts in the Y label, right? So we got the Y label. Okay, and then this down here, um, import pandas is PD. Pandas is a panel data um, function or toolbox. And this turns baseball into a data frame and then this converts the text of baseball three, which is the height into an integer. This turns baseball weight into an integer. And this turns baseball age into a float. And then this saves it as a CSV file. So if I go here to where baseball's at, this will output um, our data set into um, a CSV file that we can open in Excel, right? We can open that up in Excel, right? And then these are actual numbers. And a number, you can take the average of it, you can count it, you can get the minimum, the maximum, and you can sum it, right? If these were still strings, if these were still strings, then you couldn't average, count, get the minimum, the maximum, and the sum, right? I'll show you that here. So if we hashtag this out, right? If we hash this hashtag this out, we should probably get something different. I haven't tried it before. Let's just try it. We'll run this. 
and see if we get the same thing. I'm expecting to get uh, strings. Yeah, see here, I guess what Excel does when it opens it up, it converts the string 74 into number 74, but it doesn't know what to do with the age because if you remember what the age was, if you go back up to here to print baseball, before we convert it to a, a float, it's got a funky thing behind it. It's got a slash N behind it, right? So I guess what Excel does, it doesn't know what to do with that, so it just deletes it, right? Just deletes it. That's why it doesn't show up there, right? So you have to have, you don't have to have this or that, but you need to have this turn into a float, right? Okay, now see, yeah, so when Excel opens this up, it automatically converts those strings into to integers, but then it you have to convert that float or otherwise Excel won't know what to do with it, right? Okay, so that's beautiful soup. That's a simple regression and then a cool scatter plot or because we changed the size of it and we made the dots transparent, it's not a scatter plot, it's called a bubble chart or a bubble plot, right? And then we've uh, also learned out how to um, convert a NumPy object of multiple columns into a data frame and then save that data frame as a CSV file.